For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. For those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitav Bravi, and you're watching our weekly flagship show, The Talking Point. Welcome to all our viewers who are watching us live at this uh, unusual time, and a welcome to all those viewers who will see this streaming later. Just welcoming from the Netherlands, Martine van Billert. She is the co-founder of the Afghan Analyst Network, has worked and lived in Afghanistan for years, among other things, as a diplomat, a researcher, and even as an aid worker under the Taliban in its previous avatar. Ms. Baila, thank you so much. I do believe there's a non-fiction work of yours which is based in, probably in Kabul that's also due out, right? It's a, it's a novel. It's a work of fiction and uh, it's finished. I don't know when it will be out, but uh, I hope so. Welcome to Strat News Global and thank you for your time. It's nice to be here. And joining us from uh, Singapore, one of India's foremost foreign policy analysts, uh, Dr. C. Raja Mohan. He needs no introduction. He's the director of the Institute of uh, South Asia Studies at the National University of Singapore, an author and ex-editor. I can name a number of hats. Professor <laughs> Raja Mohan, thank you for your time. Yeah, wonderful being with you today. Ms. Violet, just wanted to uh, get your immediate views on uh, what had happened yesterday with Intel. Um, reports that uh, that's what would happen. Of course, 13, uh, at least 13 U.S. Marines or service members killed the first since February 2020, the largest since, I think, 2011 when that Chinook went down. But latest reports suggesting that the, the number of people killed and wounded would be well over 200, and most of them are Afghans. Now, that's one story that has been continuously lost for decades now. Yeah, now what happened yesterday was terrible. Um, what was happening at the airport has been terrible already for uh, for over a week. Um, people queuing at the, the at the gates, trying to get in, not be, being able to get on flights. Um, almost anybody who's been involved in Afghanistan has been very closely involved with trying to get people into the airport and uh, and on flights. Um, so I was actually in touch with someone who. Uh, who was very close to the blast. Um, so this was terrible. It was a terrible end to a terrible week. Um, and uh, yeah, people are shocked. Obviously people in Afghanistan are completely shocked. They'd hope that with everything that the Taliban brings that they don't want, that at least it would bring an end to this kind of carnage. Um, so it's uh, there's several layers of, of shock and, and grief and anger. And so for me, this is in the first place an Afghan story uh, and, and the story of, uh, of um, Afghan um, uh, grieving and, uh, and, and horror. Professor Radhamon, uh, your reaction to developments overnight uh, seen a horrible picture, of course, which we can't uh, play off Afghan civilians who are trying to get out there. But uh, as Ms. Violet is pointing out, uh, the Afghanis are reportedly in charge of security in Kabul. Could you unravel some of these many layers that Ms. Bailert is talking about? You look, uh, I think, uh, there's, there's, I think uh, for Afghans, it's been a continuing tragedy for almost uh, 40 years, bloodletting that uh, that has gone on, and the hopes uh, after 2001 that you could build a stable, a reasonably stable order, uh, that we've seen that uh, you know undermined by the direct negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban. And, uh, and the bringing in of uh, many of the terror groups today with the Haqqani network. There was a time when Americans were asking uh, for the head of the Haqqani uh, network, and today uh, they're forced to rely on them uh, for, the, for the security uh, of the people. So Biden doesn't have to look too far, perhaps, if he says, look, uh, he's going to hunt them down. Uh, many of them are in Kabul. They're, some of them are probably working with the government. So I think the, the way the, the U.S. and the West have caught themselves in a situation 
where it is really in the next few days when the withdrawal will be complete. And I don't see the evacuation continuing beyond uh, August 31st. Uh, that that you at least they'll begin to take a fresh look because you right now that the U.S. is trapped. Where if they want to continue the evacuation, they need to rely uh, on those guys who are in power today, and uh, very very powerless in a sense the U.S. to just to do what they what they came to do uh, at the end of it. So I think the, given the the other aspect, many of these terror groups are interrelated. Uh, they have uh, sanctuaries in Pakistan. So I think the U.S. knows as much about them as anybody else in the world. But so far, they've been unwilling to confront the sources of this challenge. Uh, and the focus has been really on withdrawal, uh, finding a withdrawal agreement rather than uh, a stabilizing agreement. And I think you saw from Biden's press conference. Look, I think he's not going to let anything come in his way. They want to get out. And he'll use any reason to justify it. But, but uh, they're going to go out. Uh, and, and that is the priority now. And everything else is secondary as far as the U.S. is concerned. You're talking about that uh, press conference, and I'm just going to play out one of the sound bites uh, when uh, President Biden was talking about the so-called Islamic State in Khorasan uh, province. Now, what we know from uh, reading is that there's not much territory that the ISKP holds in Afghanistan. So where is he going to go after them and when? But just playing out that sound bite of President Biden uh, when he was talking about ISIS or ISKP. We will not be deterred by terrorists. We will not let them stop our mission. We will continue the evacuation. I've also ordered my commanders to develop operational plans to strike ISIS-K assets, leadership, and facilities. We will respond with force and precision at our time, at the place we choose, in the moment of our choosing. Here's what you need to know. These ISIS terrorists will not win. We will rescue the Americans in there. We will get our Afghan allies out. And our mission will go on. America will not be intimidated. Ms. Violet, uh, your reaction to what uh, President Biden is saying, and as Professor Radhaman was pointing out, uh, you know, the Haqqanis are there, Khalil Haqqani is there. We don't know whether Siraj is there. I'm not sure about that. But uh, all these people still on the both the U.S. and the U.N. sanctions list. Yeah, I'll first respond to to this language that sure. he's using because that's it's very similar to the language that was being used after 9/11. Um, we will hunt them down. We will not forgive. We will go after them. We, we will do this with precision. Um, again, they're making this attack about Americans and about American lives and about American lives that need to be avenged. Um, uh, and yeah, I find that uh, I find that very difficult to see. Um, it's uh, it's also what, um, to a large extent, brought Afghanistan in the place that it is now. That when the Americans came in 2001, um, they arrived and continued the war on terror. They flattened the world and made the world into an analysis of enemies, people who are with us or against us. Um, this is also again the same. The language we will get at our Americans, we will get at our allies. So Afghanistan is really viewed as a place where there are allies and there are enemies and the enemies you need to go after. Um, this war on terror that they fought for years in Afghanistan created new enemies. Um, and it's really disheartening to at, at the time after 20 years when, we, when the Americans have decided to um, bring down their engagement to see this language again. It feels like we're starting over again, even though there's no presence on the ground. Um, the, the nothing's been learned. It's the same. It's the same attitude. So that's really worrying. Um, in terms of uh, Hakan being in uh, in Kabul and uh, reportedly being responsible uh, for security, um, it's obviously very very um, ironic that now the Americans are somehow informally going to be working together with the Hakanis to go after uh, ISKP. Um, so that's a uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's something we hadn't seen coming. Um, there were threats for a long time in and around Kabul and in general uh, within Taliban ranks that uh, ISKP was going to try to um, attack and target. Um, not, I'm not sure that this was an attack on Americans. Um, 
because there were a lot of or, or Americans in the first place. This was in the first place an attack that was designed to uh, for carnage um, and to grab head headlines and to be incredibly shocking, um, and that that it was. Um, and I really wish that the American leadership would stop seeing the world only through the lens of America and the damage that is being done to America. Professor Rajman, if you wanted to take on on the Haganis and uh, the others who are still on the UN and US sanctions list earlier, everything has gone out of the window. I mean, this was being seen as some kind of leverage at some point of time, but uh, how does the world, how does the US go forward from here now? No, uh, I think the first step is really, I mean, for them to endure this uh, terrible, uh, you know, situation, uh, manage to get whatever they can, I mean, out by August 31st. Uh, as we say quite clearly, there's going to be no operations after that. Uh, but it's also been uh, the nature of the, the relationship between the new rulers, that is Taliban, Haqqanis, uh, that if you see the last three press conferences, Biden has repeatedly talked about working with the Taliban and the Taliban was actually helping them. And there was actually a press conference by the central command, uh, commander. Uh, largely now, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they say Taliban is the antidote to uh, IS. Therefore, we need to work even more closely uh, with, uh, with the Taliban. Uh, I think that argument, you can see it uh, coming forward. Uh, so that is again, I think, uh, one of those uh, ironies in the in the in the current situation. So uh, my sense is the fact that the CIA chief uh, went all the way to Kabul to meet uh, Mullah Baradar. Uh, we haven't heard much what actually transpired there, uh, in the sense that uh, in some ways today, uh, that the the U.S. needs the Taliban at this stage to complete or to you know even what is promising. Uh, on commercial flights, those with visas and others, can they bring them out? So the focus there is continuing to be on uh, the evacuation. And for the Taliban, uh, how much they like Pakistan or China, uh, they're not going to be able to give the kind of financial assistance that they need, in, you know, even to run the government today. Uh, that for a country of 35 million people, I mean, the GDP at 20 billion, uh, a lot of it is probably foreign uh, uh, presence. So I think they have a huge problem. So my sense is, uh, there will be an attempted negotiation, I think, out of all this wreckage, there will still be an attempt, uh, somehow uh, Taliban uh, and even Pakistan can help them deal with the IS. I, mean, I think Pakistan's argument has been around for a long time. So I think we might see even more stranger things uh, beginning to unfold uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the days ahead because, uh, uh, as I said, look, the Americans are really, once they fully leave, probably they have some leverage on the question of uh, uh, you know, economic assistance, international recognition, but then Taliban too has leverage over the, over the U.S. and the West of actually letting people out, uh, of letting humanitarian assistance in. So I think it's an awfully uh, interconnected thing, and I think uh, my fear is Taliban will continue to have upper hand uh, despite the levers uh, that the West has on legitimacy, uh, recognition, etc. Is Bharat, your understanding of this so-called Islamic State, Khorasan province, uh, as many would say, it's just a lot of pissed off <laughs> Taliban members who have joined there, or uh, they have had action against each other. The Afghan uh, National Army was also used, apart from US airstrikes. Do you see it as uh, what many in India would say is uh, the ISI's insurance policy against the Taliban, as Professor Rajamon was pointing out, you know, now this this, the Taliban is a good Taliban, and the bad Taliban is the IS. I don't know about that, about the insurance uh, policy. Um, uh, what I know is that they, over the years they have been hit very hard by a combination of the Afghan security forces, the Americans, uh, and the Taliban. So the Taliban and ISKP are, are um, really at each other's throat. Uh, as you said earlier, they, uh, they lost a lot of territory. They have almost no territory, but they have um, they clearly have networks in place, and particularly in Kabul, that, are, that really worry the Taliban. Um, and so the Taliban might now find itself in a position where it is trying to be the government, um, and it is facing a, a terror group that is uh, uh, attacking them. And so it's an inversion of their earlier uh, earlier situation. Um, and, as, and, as, and as I said, the, the main... Um, uh, 
What's really terrible about it is for the population, because the population is just hoping that finally they will have a situation where there would not be a continued war, that there would not be a continued fear of bomb attacks, and particularly these huge attacks inside the um, heavily populated areas. Um, and we will probably, at least we have now the seed of an excuse for the US to, to continue to be involved uh, in Afghanistan, uh, to continue to be militarily involved from a distance. Um, whereas we just had this brief window where people thought maybe, maybe, maybe the violence will go down um, or stop. Yeah, it, it, it did seem like that uh, till yesterday, despite uh, those warnings that were, were there for many years. Uh, Professor Rajman, we were just uh, playing some excerpts from uh, a documentary that we had uh, put out, I think, in March 2020 with uh, you know, the Indians who had joined the ISKP in Afghanistan and surrendered and some women were there. Subsequently, prisons have been you know, uh, emptied with both the Taliban and the ISKP members. Some reports suggesting the ISKP head was killed by the Taliban. But that uh, thought or that I had put out earlier about uh, uh, ISKP being an insurance policy for the Taliban if they were moving out of GHQ or Rawalpindi's control. Uh, do you subscribe to that? No, I think, look, this is the shadowy world of, uh, you know, insurgent groups, uh, intelligence agencies working with them. Uh, it's it's so murky. I mean, I think uh, I would not venture to make this definitive uh, assessment that, look, uh, this is really a sophisticated, calculated policy uh, that uh, someone is uh, is organizing it. But for, for I think, uh, for both Pakistan and India, I think the threats are going to be there. I mean, I think for Pakistan, how much it thinks it can control the the range of uh, extremist forces that have been unleashed, uh, some of them would also work in Pakistan uh, with the TTP, with other groups. So it's not as if uh, Pakistan can sit at a master switch and manipulate it, and they themselves will be vulnerable to uh, potentially uh, uh, the, the consequences of what is happening in Afghanistan. For India, I think, look, while India needs to put its guard up uh, against the renewal of terror, uh, the well-known groups uh, gaining ground in the wake of this. It must also be prepared, I think, for the radicalization, because the inspirational uh, uh, quality of Taliban's victory, uh, and I think we're coming to the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and to have this kind of a play just before that anniversary comes, uh, even if Americans are gone, I mean, the triumph would have been great, but the way this has unfolded, uh, this is going to trigger groups which want to do similar things in their own countries. And Pakistan first and India, I think, will be quite vulnerable. And Bangladesh too, uh, where there is a radical elements which have been targeting the government for a long time. So I think we should be prepared, whether who, irrespective of who is responsible for organizing them, uh, the consequence of this, both uh, the known terror groups as well as the impact of this development on the radicalization of uh, extremist groups, uh, in uh, in the South Asian societies. So this is going to be a huge, huge challenge. Uh, just when we thought we were overcoming uh, a lot of that, so we, we are entering a phase, I think, where uh, it's going to be quite dangerous for, for India, for Pakistan, for Bangladesh. Ms. Violet, as you were saying, uh, you know, the focus in the, in the days to come, weeks, months, we don't even know now that, you know, we've gone full circle in 20 years, is on the Afghans itself and what they'll have to face and completely uh, dreadful thoughts there. But what Professor Mohan was saying in terms of uh, the fallout or the blowback in South Asia or larger regions, whether it's Pakistan or India, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are mainly that it's really early days. Um, because I think we're, because I think a lot of us feel kind of disoriented because um, relations have been reshuffled. Um, the role of the U.S. is going to change, but we don't know in which ways. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm actually very, very careful in speculating or commenting. Um, I'd actually like to keep an open mind because it's going to be changing. So it's easier not to preempt it, but to actually see how, how it's moving. Uh, Professor Adamman, just uh, putting up a question from one of our viewers. Um, should, shouldn't India have an Afghan? Strategy now condemning is not sufficient. Action is uh, required. Uh, your take. You've been writing a lot about that. Uh... Look, I think at this point, uh, I think uh, India is, uh, you know, uh, uh, leverage in the situation is limited. So I think any strategy will have to recognize 
that after two decades where the American induced stability in Afghanistan gave a chance for India to do a lot of good things in Afghanistan, development, cooperation, uh, political and economic engagement across the board uh, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan. But once the security has been taken away, uh, India, uh, I think, will not be able to do the kind of things it has done uh, for, the, for the last 20 years in Afghanistan. So that itself automatically one element presents itself. Second, uh, unlike Pakistan and Iran, India does not have an actual border uh, to, to Afghanistan. In some senses, that is good in the sense that uh, the blowback uh, is not immediate and direct. But at the same time, that what India can do to alter the internal equations, the kind of capacity that Pakistan has through direct intervention, uh, the way that it has done by nurturing the Taliban, or Iran, which has a huge border too, and they got their own militias, they got their own way of uh, engaging the Afghan society and its uh, people. So they're in a very different league, which India is not. Uh, so, so therefore, I think our, our cards are limited. There is a diplomatic leverage, I think, as a member of the Security Council and as a member of the Taliban Sanctions Committee. Uh, India will get uh, some uh, say in how uh, the international system is going to react. The second, I think, uh, India will have to build uh, coalitions uh, with other countries uh, who have similar objectives. Uh, there's been uh, quite a frenetic bit of activity in the last uh, few weeks. And before this terror incident happened, it seemed much of the region was really quite reconciled to dealing with the Taliban. The swiftness of the victory, uh, Russians, for example, I mean, they were singing praises of the Taliban. Chinese were signaling they're now ready to come in. Uh, and uh, Iranians, too. I mean, they did not really object to uh, what, what happened uh, in the last few weeks. But I wondered to see uh, if the terror incidents and the whole problem that even Taliban's victory is not going to produce automatic stability. Then I think that opens all kinds of questions. I mean, there I would agree with uh, or other panelists that look, a lot of things are open ended at this point. Uh, it is not clear internally a stable structure can be produced and how they will affect the external, uh, both the neighbors as well as the major powers. So I think there is a lot of uncertainty. So I think, India, you know, we should not be in this hurry. Look, do we have a strategy? Let's do something right now. Uh, I think sometimes you, you have to wait, you have to see. Uh, how the, the internal and the external dynamics of Afghanistan are going to play out. Uh, uh, so I think it's better to be patient uh, at this point rather than imagining uh, that, that somehow India can put, push itself back. I think last 20 years were exceptional in India's engagement with Afghanistan. And those kind of days are not going to come anytime soon. But So the work is going to be different, uh, more, more difficult, and more uh, intensive engagement uh, with the international system. Uh, as well as the uh, Afghan people, to the extent that uh, we have contacts and communication with different groups uh, within Afghanistan. The Taliban or the ISI Pakistan had strategic missions for 20 years. Um, Ms. Bharat, in terms of uh, regional powers, I mean, I, I, I hate to keep, you know, taking the focus off the Afghans, but just to see what's going to happen to their future, it is important to see how we, uh, the other countries would react. How do you see Iran? Iran, uh, I mean, you know, they were the first to, I think, send fuel to uh, once Taliban were in Kabul. Water is the reverse flow for that, very crucial for Iran. Uh, how do you see if I can start off with Iran? Yeah. Um, I mean, we know that Iran has been in touch with parts of the Taliban uh, already for years. We know also that they've been pragmatic in the past. Um, and so uh, it, it does seem uh, that they're going to be uh, uh, trying to have a very pragmatic relationship um, with the Taliban. Uh, they were, um, I think they were very, uh, they had a very mixed uh, feelings about the U.S. leaving. Um, obviously, they were nervous about having the U.S. next door, but were also nervous uh, for the instability that it might bring um, and so the swift takeover um, probably came as a kind of a relief uh, as it as as it seemed that it could be stable um, and um, yeah early all early signs is that they're going to be, uh, be very pragmatic in dealing with the Taliban. Professor Rajamohan uh, on China we've seen a, a lot of reports we've seen what happened when uh, Mullah Barada and that eight member delegation visited Tianjin and uh, Wang Yi and others met him. How do you see uh, China? There's a lot of reporting that there's a, you know, some kind of a quid pro quo security for development and then the CPEC moving through. 
Pakistan to Afghanistan and Central Asia is what the Chinese are looking at. See, historically, I think China has been quite cautious in getting drawn into the conflicts uh, in other countries, uh, let alone uh, on their own periphery. But the last four or five years, as Chinese power has grown, they become more assertive in the pursuit of their uh, national interests. We've seen the Chinese step in uh, far more boldly than before into finding to mediate uh, in Afghanistan, trying to work more closely with Russia, with, the, with Pakistan and uh, Central Asian actors. So in terms of activism and the scale of interest the Chinese are showing, that has certainly increased. Second, I think for Pakistan, uh, uh, the idea that look in the 96 to 2000 period when Taliban was in power, uh, China, Pakistan had a free hand, but it could not do very much development. It could do nothing really. Uh, today, I think the Pakistani contacts on the ground, its security role in the region in Afghanistan, coupled with the Chinese money and capital, uh, was hopefully a way of, uh, you know, doing, you know, more uh, in the, this time around on the development side and more on the stabilization side. And in the last couple of weeks, the Chinese were hinting that, look, they'll be open. They'll be open to contribution uh, to the development of, uh, of, the, of Afghanistan. But the Chinese also have a problem in Xinjiang, the question of the new government's external orientation. That is, uh, the promises they made about not letting the soil uh, be used against terror groups. They've stuck to that uh, framing vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis everyone. But Chinese, I'm sure, would be skeptical whether this can actually be implemented. So they're going to wait and see, too, I mean, whether uh, how the, the various terror groups that operate in Xinjiang, uh, how they're going to behave and how Taliban is, will be open to, uh, you know, curbing them uh, to, to, to meet the Chinese requirements. So that is, again, an open-ended uh, question. And, and finally, uh, for, the, for the Chinese, the, the challenge is if there is terrorism, if there is no stability of what we've seen happen in the last few days, then the whole talk about economic investment, $1 trillion of you know minerals, rare earths. But I think a lot of it was really you know getting way, way ahead of the story. If there is no stability, that is, if Taliban cannot produce a new national consensus, it's a matter of time. The organized groups or various other extremist groups, there will be fights. There will be contestation of a power. And I think that's going to produce, once again, conflict. And that is not going to be uh, very, uh, you know, and uh, permissive of a serious uh, investment in developmental work. Ms. Uh, Bayard, if you want to uh, make a comment on China, and I also wanted you to see how would the Taliban uh, behave in future in governance? What do you expect? Yeah, I mean, we're all watching how the Taliban is going to behave both towards its own population uh, and towards the rest of the world. I mean, for the rest of the world, they're, they're projecting we're now going to be the new government. We're here. We're a force of stability and we expect to be treated in this way. Um, uh, so let's see. Let's see how the world uh, responds to that. Um, towards their own population, they're saying um, actually the same. Nobody has anything to fear. We've given an amnesty. Um, uh, yes, we're an Islamic group, but we've learned since we were in power last time. Um, uh, so we have to see. I mean, basically what we're seeing now is, is three faces of the Taliban, the very smooth talking spokespeople, um, the Doha, the, the political commission in Doha that is, is, is quite good at international relations, um, uh, and a, a very smooth uh, social media campaign with lots of pictures of uh, government offices starting to meet, the repair of the Kandahar Kabul road starting up again. There's, um, they're really portraying this this uh, um, uh, image of a, a movement that is uh, working. And that's that's what they're looking for, looking at, um, and that's going to be milder than they were in the past. Then the second phase we have is um, the fighters in the street um, who are uh, employing uh, rules in practice that their leadership haven't announced yet, or that haven't even said are not necessary. Um, so, for instance, they clap down on the Independence Day uh, processions with the national flag, whereas the leadership had said, any flag is fine, um, we respect them all. Um, they're uh, harassing people for how they're dressed, even though there are no rules yet. So we have a de facto implementation of rules and practices on the ground, which the leadership is not yet reining in. 
Um, so they, they say one thing, but they're not stopping their fighters from doing something else. Um, and then the third uh, thing we see is that contrary to the announcement of the amnesty, there is an actual seeking out of people and the targeting of people. Um, and there are a lot of Afghans that are in hiding at the moment. And so a lot of the people we saw um, crowding at the airport, they're not all staff of international organizations. They're also not all just people worried about their jobs or whatever. A lot of them were people who had been in hiding for a long time and really needed to get out. Um, and so that, how that will play out has not, has, has not yet, what, what, what's going to be the real face we'll have to see, and it will obviously be different for different groups of Afghans as well. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of what the government will look like, they keep saying we're going to announce it soon, and they keep stalling, saying when the leader is gone, when the Americans are gone. And so I think we won't actually see what it will look like um, before the 31st of August. There is really a, a bit of waiting um, to see there. They've been talking a lot about national, or about a unity government, um, but so far all appointments we've seen on provincial, district level, department level, have all been mullahs and maulawis, all from their own ranks. Uh, so, so far there has been no um, sharing of the power um, and also all the talks with other politicians at the moment seem yeah. to have the level of curtsy calls. So, um, sure. yeah. yeah. Uh, both Kar Karzai, Abdullah, I don't know about Ekmati, but uh, Ms. Violet, your thoughts on uh, how there is still a narrative that has been putting out, put out, even though it's not uh, very thick, in terms of the Panjshir being the last bastion of uh, resistance. Considering the current situation, both internal and external, uh, how do you see that, that out, Ms. Violet? Well, it's very early for a resistance. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. Afghans feel that it's very early for a resistance. They just, they first want to see, is this a government that will hold? Is this a government that will bring a certain stability? Can we live with it? Ahmad Massoud is also untested politically yeah. and militarily. He doesn't represent uh, the whole, even of all the Panchiris or the Jamiatis. He's a faction in there. So it's, um, he, he launched it, I think, in the international media because it's a, it's a very good story. Um, mm -hmm. it, it plays well. It, it might become something. Um, at the moment, it's not. Um, the, just, the second round of talks with the Taliban just broke down, I understood. Um, but I think what, for the moment, what he really hopes it does is that it uh, leads to an agreement that there will be no Taliban rule in Panjshir. Um, I think at the moment, that's the main, um, the main aim of it. But uh, it, it could be an area, particularly if it uh, uh, retains independence, it could be a gathering ground for um, former parts of the army corps, um, particularly if the Taliban starts clamping down or starts losing some of the commanders that have joined them in all these deals when they ru rush through the country. So it could become a gathering ground. But um, there, there's no real... Um, it, yeah, there's no option for it to become a proper resistance at this point. And no outside support is yet. Uh, Prakar Aristogi, Professor Mona asks uh, you this. You once wrote that the U.S. will continue to be relevant in the region given the hasty withdrawal. Do you still believe in the U.S. involvement in this region in future? I think it's linked to you know what uh, the Global Times say, uh, laughing about uh, the situation, Taiwan, Russia. Uh, and allies, he's been Vice President Kamala Harris in Southeast Asia. The U.S. standing, I, I think that's where uh, this question is leading, Professor Mohan. No, I briefly mentioned uh, earlier that, look, uh, that where do you get money? to? Because Taliban is, doesn't even have money to run the government at this point. Uh, ATMs are empty. Banks are in bad shape. Uh, the U.S. has frozen the, uh, the financial assets, I mean, close to about $10 billion. Uh, it's also blocking uh, remittances, I believe, uh, from you know the Afghan diaspora, which is in North America. So uh, they, they can, and then the so the sheer financial pressure. I mean, I think they have levers to sustain this for quite some time. Uh, it used to be said before that look, Taliban has all the time, and the Americans are looking at the watch, so uh, Taliban can wait. Okay, now if they won, uh, they also if they need to run a government, uh, they need. Uh, the international, you know, the international financial system and the multilateral institutions to support, and the Americans can wait. I mean, they say, look, we're no rush to lift the freeze or uh, 
uh, let the finances flow to you. Uh, so that will depend on a, on, a, on negotiation. So that's a leverage straight away they have. Second, I think if you see the last few weeks, US, European Union, UK, they've all insisted on a set of conditionalities for the normalization uh, for the recognition of the new government. So which is where the, the political legitimacy uh, question uh, comes in. Uh, so that again, I think is a is a lever for the for the United States, and I think uh, you know I think we can ignore for a moment the Global Times kind of an argument. Uh, they're just having a lot of uh, fun with the uh, with the kind of tragedy that is unfolding. <coughs> Those of us in Asia, I, mean, I think we remember what happened in Saigon. The the metaphor is constantly used. Uh, Americans were down and out. Uh, the Russian Soviet Union was proclaiming, "Look, the world is now turning towards socialism." The triumphant march of uh, socialist forces, a full Marxist interpretation of where the world was going. And five years later, there was a guy called President Reagan. Uh, they started this whole new Cold War against the against the Russians. And it was the, the Russians who collapsed, not the United States. So I think it will be, uh, uh, I think the US had a bad setback here. Uh, but the, given the kind of resources they have, I mean, they, they're going to now pull up their socks and I think come back at it. So they'll have significant levers. I mean, how much they can do in Afghanistan. Right now, the focus will be on finances and international diplomacy. They'll have a big say uh, what's going to happen. Uh, and the, the rest of it, uh, is, as Biden said today, I mean, they can always come and keep dropping cruise missiles if uh, things uh, go at them. In some senses, they liberated from the Pakistan's dependence on Pakistan. Until now, the troops were inside, the ground lines of communication. Etc. Uh, the dependence on Pakistan. I think in some sense they're freer, and that's where the question: uh, if the evacuation has to be complete, and the Taliban also needs to facilitate things for the international community, and so that's where I think there will be room for negotiation. I think between the Taliban and the and the U.S. and the and the international community uh, of the West. So uh, how that plays out, so I think U.S. will still have a big say in how the world is going to deal with the with the Taliban. Ms. Barrett, you were talking about uh, everyone waiting to see how the Taliban will govern and the signs that were already there or signs that weren't and we can still see. But the points that uh, Professor Rajapon was raising in terms of finances, you know, whether it's the IMF or money that has been blocked or remittances, remittances, and the fact that if they use that as a lever, it's actually aid for people uh, in Afghanistan, which will be hit. How do you see, you know, where does the Taliban get its money from? Still from drugs? Um, well, they they uh, traditionally got money from uh, informal taxation in the areas sure. uh, that they rule. Um, so I assume that that will uh, be ongoing. They hold the the customs, uh, uh, the border crossings, so there will be money coming from there. We don't know yet if how they've organized that and where that money is going and who's deciding on that. Um, but obviously, we're all very, very worried about the financial situation and the economic situation uh, in Afghanistan, and people are already feeling it. And um, so it's, it's logical that the world uh, needs to wait and see how the government, of, uh, the Taliban government will shape up. There's also been talk about sanctions. And at the same time, Afghanistan doesn't have a lot of time. Um, you know, the, the, the country itself cannot be without money for a long time. Um, government, of, uh, like teachers, um, policemen, they can't just continue to not receive uh, salary because the Afghan government was already in trouble before the Taliban took over and was already running out of money. Um, so it, it is going to be very important to use that money as a leverage, um, but, not, but not to only withhold it. To be able to use it as a leverage, some of it also needs to be released also to, to stave off a humanitarian crisis. Um, but particularly things like blocking remittances, um, uh, closing down the or, uh, or Western Union, um, that's hugely problematic. Um, I mean, people are already selling uh, their household goods uh, for money. Um, prices, are, prices are up. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's not a lot of time to, to start helping out or to at least release the money that, that's already available for the country. With, with, um, uh, with all the con conditionality that that can, I mean, there, you, have no you have no leverage without having something to give. Um, so yeah, uh, international organizations and nations need to really start figuring out how to, who to talk to about this and, and how to do that. 
Martin Van Abailer, thank you so much for your time, your experience, and your expertise. Uh, your debut on Strat News Global. We hope to have you more often as and when you time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Pleasure was ours also for Professor Rajamon. I can't find uh, some of those comments that were praising both of our panelists, uh, comparing us to what we have mm -hmm. done, which is work in mainstream television and saying we're really glad that uh, we get panelists like this to listen to. Thank you, Professor Mohan, as well. Thank you, Amitabh. And just a reminder to our viewers, uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do that. Uh, also follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to get the latest news and analysis from an Indian perspective. This is Talking Point on Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brevi.